Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Sustainable Work. I have Dr. Lacey Barber with me here today. Hi, Lacey. Hi, Maria. Uh, Dr. Lacey Barber is a dedicated educator and researcher in the field of organizational psychology with a focus on occupational stress and well-being. In her role as an associate professor at San Diego State University, she is passionate about understanding how organizations can use evidence-based strategies to create a psychologically healthy workplace where employees thrive. Much of her research explores how technology affects work-life balance and workplace stress. She is particularly interested in how both companies and workers can help optimize the benefits of workplace technology while reducing the psychological costs of heightened online connectivity. Her research on workplace telepressure and well-being has received grant funding from Society of Human Resource Management Foundation. She received an Early Career Achievement Award for exceptionally early career contributions to the science of occupational health psychology. Welcome, Lacey. I'm so honored to have you here. Thank you. And I'm excited to be here. Yes, that is great. <laughs> yeah, so why don't you tell us a little bit about you? How did you get to be interested in the field of organizational psychology and particularly in uh, worker stress and well being and the area of uh, how technology interacts with that, with work, worker uh, well being and stress? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. So that's for me going back to my undergraduate studies. Uh, I actually got involved uh, very early on in research in a health lab um, doing the, the big word for that one was psychoneuroimmunology. So basically <laughs> <laughs> the, the physical physio side of it. Um, and so I started out in a health lab and then I went into a social psychology lab and um, then I didn't find IO psychology or industrial organizational psychology till later. Um, and spe specifically on like worker, um, just general work issues, right, was, was the main area. But I realized, oh, I can combine health and social aspects mm -hmm. in the workplace. And so uh, really early on, I was interested in work stress. And for me, as a first generation college student who also worked 30, 40 hours a week while I was going to school, um, you know, it was a big issue and coming from like that working class background and I thought a lot about health and different types of work environments and for me having a very different type of work environment as well going into college from some of my other family members. So, um, so that's kind of how I got into it. And then once I got to graduate school, I've been studying those issues for quite some time, but it all started with uh, my undergraduate project that I did on um, anxiety and work hour issues among like working students. Um, so I, I started there. So I've been doing this for a long time. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing. You know, it just reminds me about a little bit about my own journey to IO psychology, where I loved social psychology and worked in also uh, social cognitive neuroscience lab in my undergrad, which is also a mouthful. <laughs> Yeah, but then also discovered IO psychology and, you know, throughout my life, I went back to my undergrad under, to get my undergraduate degree when I was 25 and also worked all through my undergrad. Mm -hmm. And for me also, what was very important is uh, how do I find fulfillment in my work? And so when I found IO psychology, I was like, wow, this is like so relevant. I've been seeking for an answer for myself, but here is this amazing field of psychology that can uh, like take it to next level. Now I can help other people do the same. So. Yeah, no, I, I felt the same way. I think that was my excitement. And especially um, I was actually working at Cheesecake Factory at the time um, when I was an undergrad, one of my many service jobs that I had. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, in, in working in the service and food industry so much, I just felt so, you know, burnt out by it. Um, and also just kind of realizing that part of the reason is that it didn't really fit you know, my personality style, I'm a little bit more introverted and I can fake extroversion <laughs> fine for a while, but I get really exhausted. And so, you know, not having any kind of downtime during work or alone work time. And I think that's where 
my excitement when I was doing academic work and I got into research assistantships as a grad student, I was like, oh, I actually love working long hours on data analysis and things like that by myself. It's not just work is exhausting. It really matters what type of work you're doing and your own interests. So, um, so I think that that's what's really fun and to know that that differs for everyone. So I just find that fascinating. Yes, it's, you know, one thing that comes to mind for me when you mentioned that uh, one thing that I remember about you from like grad school, I remember a moment when we were talking about standing a uh, workstation and uh, walking treadmills. So you have a walking treadmill and you are the one who introduced me to it. And actually in my previous, in my corporate position, I had one too uh, at work, but I remember you said, you know, I can just, I'll, I'll be walking on my treadmill and then like three hours later, I'm working on this complicated data analysis. And I thought to myself, three hours on a data analysis walking on a treadmill. <laughs> I do. I lose track of time on it. And uh, when I started it, so I do have to say a health, you know, warning for that when you start working on the treadmill, I, I worked up to that amount of time. So, you know, you have to start out slow and yeah. just a few tasks, but, um, but yeah, I kind of built up. Uh, but yeah, so sometimes it would happen before I was ready to work longer hours on it that I would just lose track of time because I'm absorbed in manuscript writing and data analysis. And I, you know, I've always been a writer too. So I've liked writing and that was part of it. And so I get into the flow, right, of my work. And then all of a sudden I realize, oh, I've been walking for like three hours straight. And then you get off the treadmill desk and you're like, ouch. And it just doesn't hit you until you're done with that. You know? yes. yes. Okay. Well, okay. Let's dive into this. I'm so excited to speak to you. Uh, so I want to start with how do you define sustainable work? Yeah, and that's that's a great question because this is something that I've thought a lot of and you know talked to a lot of people about as part of my job. And uh, for me, the big difference that I think about it is in so in organizational psychology, we have these distinctions between two, um, two concepts that are called work engagement versus workaholism. Mm -hmm. And for me, sustainable engagement is closer to the idea of work engagement, where we feel, uh, when we're working, we feel vigorous, we feel kind of excited emotionally to get back to work. Um, we feel dedicated to our work, we feel like it makes a difference and it's meaningful. And um, we also, speaking of the treadmill desk thing, we feel absorbed, we get into that flow very easily with our work. And motivationally, that's a good experience, like in terms of sustainable engagement, because that that helps us feel, you know, strong and vigorous while we're working. And so that's the kind of engagement that we want. Um, workaholism, though, is really more motivationally different in terms of people are still doing things. So there's that behavioral part that that's part of work engagement, too. But they feel like they're working excessively, like more than they want, and they're working compulsively. And the compulsion is really the big part because everyone focuses on hours that people work. And unless we're talking about a huge amount of hours, which is unsustainable for anyone, right? Um, we can work a lot of hours on things that make us feel excited. Um, yes. Scripts data analysis for me, I have no problem working on quite a few hours of that, whereas, you know, someone else, and I saw your face on that, like a lot of people are just like, no, that would, that's, you know, three hours of data analysis is too much for some people. And why? Because you're not really excited about it, or maybe it's frustrating. And so, um, but you feel like you have to do it. And so I think like sustainable engagement is this feeling that we have that like we you know, when we go and we rest. So part of it is also this cycle of work and rest where I can go and I work, I take a rest from the work, but do you go back and do you feel energized? Do you feel excited to get back to it? And it, it's purposeful, there's meaning to it. And workaholism, the only purpose is the have to, not the want to. And I think one challenge that organizations have with this is that they, they don't see a difference behaviorally because people who are uh, engaged in their work, work engagement, what we've talked about, work engagement, look very similar to workaholics in terms of involvement. Like they, they have that working, they're doing work. However, like the long-term effects 
and the big picture effects actually look a lot different in terms of their long-term performance and their social connections. Mm -hmm. So I always say like when you have workaholics, they're really more about me metrics because it's like, well, I have to do this. And what do I have to do to survive and show that I'm working? And then, you know, you can only give, keep that up so long before you crash. And so workaholics might look like they're doing really great until all of a sudden they're not. And that's when and they crash because you just hit that exhaustion stage. Um, and then in the meantime, they're, they're very much in their own bubble, getting stuff done, you know, and um, focusing on the hitting metrics that they have to do to look good. Engaged workers are very different. Again, they're going through those cycles of rest and replenishment. They feel energized. So they are like the energizer bunny, keep going and going and going, but because they're also taking appropriate breaks with it um, as well. And instead of being me focused, I think in, we see that engaged workers are more we focused. They focus on, it's not just about my metrics, I wanna help the whole team. We wanna lift up everybody mm -hmm. and they wanna be part of that broader social ecosystem of helping the organization do well. So, so there's that long-term um, difference that really matters. Um, and then also the social difference that really matters on engaged people like want to stay involved more broadly. Yeah, and you said they differ motivationally. And so what I'm hearing is the motivation for the engaged worker, like I want to be here. I'm here voluntarily. I want to contribute versus the workaholic. It's like, oh, I have to do this. I yeah. have to do this. And um, yeah, so and to be fair, to be fair, because people always ask me, well, technically, isn't all of work you have to do it? And it's true, like true, like really work requirements, they're work requirements because you really do have to do it, right? Or you, there are consequences, you get fired. But the trick is that, you know, some of the have tos are also want tos. So how do we kind of align have tos and want tos? And we talk about that a lot with um, job crafting, what can you do to change, to, um, to kind of change the nature of what your tasks are, how you go about doing the task so you feel more excited about doing it you know maybe for people who are doing things individually they don't get excited about working alone um, not as much as I do but you put them on team projects and now the have to is more fun it's more social they want to and so that kind of help fits in need that they have and so part of it is also like helping people integrate the self a little bit more on how can I express my passions, my desires more at work. And that makes the have to's also be a want to, which is nice. Yes, and I, I'm totally related to what you're saying because for me, on the, the it's the opposite, right? If I'm on, on the team, if I'm on the team and I'm contributing and we're doing things together, I'm excited and my have to's become want to's. Like have to's don't even arise most of the time. Uh, it's not the case with just working alone. It's a little bit more challenging for me. <laughs> But, you know, I wonder, um, so where, where does it stem from, right? Workaholism versus work engagement. Like where is that the individual differences? Is this the organizational environment? How does one become one versus the other? Yeah. And, you know, the typical psychological answer is it's a little of both, you know, it's always, um, and actually both, I, I will expand that, but it's more because you said individual is it within the person is it within the work characteristics? So that's another one. But then the other one is, it, is it also in our social environment? That's the third one. So, um, you know, a, a lot of it, so to go with like some of us, yes, have individual, like we're, we're just more, um, there's some people that are just generally more enthusiastic or engaged or have more energy. But part of that is also the alignment with these jobs that are doing something you're passionate about. And sometimes, Sometimes it's not even changing what you're doing. It's, it's changing how you think about what you're doing. So I often call this that sometimes people have the head, uh, head versus heart disconnection that sometimes you can get so bogged down with the task that you're doing that you lose sight of what you're trying to do, you know, and so kind of thinking of it at those bigger goals and passions, like, why am I doing this? Why, why is this important? So you know, as an academic, for example, one of the big tasks we can roll our eyes about, like, oh, I have to do this journal review, and it can be a whole thing, and it, it's really hard, but you're like, but why am I reviewing this? It's like, well, this is an opportunity um, to review someone else's work and give them feedback to help them improve science, and that this also might be a really cool study that I want to get out there and help others, 
you know, and so part of that is just like stepping back and really thinking about that, those higher order goals, what are we trying to do? Because too much, we, we just get into the tasky busyness, right? And so you can be busy without thinking about the goals or the significance of what you're doing. And so some of that's connecting there. Some of it is the actual task itself where we need to change the work design. So like you said, the, yeah. the team aspect, like we have people who like to work on teams and we don't have them on teams. And you say, can we do this as a team? Or can we have a social accountability buddy where we check in together? Um, so there's those, those kind of strategies you can do to change the work design. Sometimes it's also the socialization, uh, so, uh, socialization that's the right word, and how we see our work environment and how we talk about our work environment. And so there's a contagion effect there that we might on our own, like our jobs, be really excited about something. But if everyone around you is complaining and saying, oh, we have to do this, I have to do this. Mm -hmm. Oh, now we have to do this you start internalizing that moment like, oh, that's not a really good task. And you even start kind of question whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. And then what other people are saying now affects your perceptions. And we see that happen a lot. It's called social processing theory that like, uh, we see it happen with job satisfaction, for example, um, people who really like a job, all of a sudden, nothing about the job changes, but you get a few people in there that hate it. And then they're also kind of complaining and spreading it. And now everyone hates it, right? So. Um, and some of those are, are good things. Maybe people saw injustices they didn't think about before and it's valid, but sometimes it's just kind of like spreading of maybe a bad attitude. Um, and so mm -hmm. understanding the difference is always important. Okay. So you mentioned that there is uh, behaviorally workaholism and work engagement look the same to the organization, but where you see uh, where you start seeing an effect is long term. So, what it, what is that long term effect for one versus the other? The long term effect is burnout, um, and so what burnout would be is you just see that the person long term they were high performers at first, and then they get lower and lower. So the performance actually mm -hmm. um, dissip dissipates over time. The other thing is just turnover, they leave. So you've used them up and they leave. And so if you have a lot of turnover in your organization, it probably indicate, in, but the, in turnover of high performers in particular, mm -hmm. that means they'd rather leave the job on good terms, but they just can't feel like they can't sustain that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, and I understand. So like the work engagement concept, the being engaged, that's sustainable. Workaholism is not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and motivationally, that's where the motivation makes a difference. And I think you also see if you if organizations really dig into it, that's why I said if you really look at metrics, because a lot of times workaholism, you you start gaming metrics, you start thinking about, well, how is my performance being measured? And you can mm -hmm. make it look good on that side. But other when you look at performance more holistically and and more interactions, that's where you see it. Like I said, like they're not really contributing to teams that well or um like that so that's where that's where it comes out but it's it's hard because i think for organizations the behaviors look the same at first so it's hard for them to tell the difference and they think everything's fine until it's not yeah and i think you've talked about some ways of um how you can move from um workaholism to engagement one of them is individual mindset right how do i think about my work as an individual and then on the level of uh perhaps the team how i can engage this person or, or how can i craft the job of this person so that they are engaged versus uh yeah. versus in workaholism space <laughs> yes okay yeah and i i would add the the other one would be uh, on work design too because we haven't talked about i was talking about more of the tasks itself but i think i think respecting and building and recovery and rest and to expectations so that's kind of where this leads mm -hmm. to um my big passion on studying the virtual work environment and um, because what we're seeing is that, you know, people don't feel like they can turn off because they always have access to their work. Their coworkers always have access to them. And so they feel like they can't really disconnect. And that's part of the, the issue that we run into is um, 
how can organizations respect uh, virtual boundaries for their employees and help them establish and build them. So, yeah. so again, so they can, because even if you have an engaged employee, so we'll start there, someone who starts out really engaged, if they feel like they can never get rest and recovery during off work hours, if they feel like they don't really have off work hours, um, you're gonna push them into workaholism very quickly. Yes, I can totally see that. Okay. Um... Yeah, so let's talk about that then. Uh, let's talk about uh, how, and I mean, it's so relevant right now, right? After, or we still are in the pandemic, but after 2020, since so many people have moved to uh, working remotely, um, it's very relevant right now. So what what effects uh, does this um, pressure to stay connected have on sustainable work engagement? Yeah, so you know, a lot of my research, as you mentioned, has been on the concept of workplace telepressure. And we've had a lot of similar ideas. Um, so there's also, you, people might hear like um, information and communication technology expectations. So that's another mouthful, but kind of the expectation from the organization um, that you need to be online or respond immediately. Um, Workplace telepressure is more the psychological state of the individual. So me feeling like I have to respond very quickly. So I have that urge to actually respond. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's also the preoccupation with responding quickly. So it's also this thought process of like, oh no, I, I keep thinking about like, if I hear a message Dean, right? I need to get back to them really quickly. And, um, you know, the, the, the idea behind telepressure, and this comes with messages, so it comes from the idea that, you know, things like email, text messages, these message-based technologies were supposed to be convenient. They were supposed to let you respond when you had time. It's not like a phone call, like I call you up and say, or, or what we're doing right now, where it's like, if I don't respond to you, I'm going to look awkward. I just <laughs> sit and ignore you, right? Um, but an email, if you send me an email or you send me a text message, it's supposed to give me the flexibility to respond when I want. And it's actually had the opposite effect in our current environment that people feel like they need to respond immediately. And so the, the key terms we use is, is what we're doing right now, you and me with this interview, we're having a synchronous communication. This is at the same time. Those text messages are supposed to be asynchronous at different times. And that's supposed to give us flexibility. But with the online environment, what we're doing is we're treating asynchronous communications as synchronous. Mm -hmm. And that's where the trouble starts because it's supposed to be a different medium to give the flexibility and we're not treating it that way. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so what this has led to, so I've been, been studying telepressure. And so what I see with my research is, is associated with more worker exhaustion, um, more, uh, they're more likely to be uh, absent from work. They're more um, likely to have sleep disruption issues. And so, you know, there's some health consequences. And it's also telepressure is not related to work engagement. Telepressure is related to workaholism. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, telepressure is also getting at that compulsive motivation that I have to, have to, have to. And I don't mean this too as it's, um, you know, a, a bad, like it comes from a bad place from the person because I, what I've seen or how I've thought about it, it it's telepressure is also associated with um, the need to belong. Mm. So what, what is happening is telepressure hijacks our good intentions of wanting to be helpful, wanting to be a good team member. Like I wanna be a good employee. I want to be there for you. But when we can't turn that off and have these like predictable recovery times, um, that's when we have the sleep disruption issues, exhaustion. Oh, and one of a big outcome that my research has shown, we have a lot of um, work-life balance issues. So it does reduce your satisfaction with your work-life balance. It creates more work-life conflict and, um, and even lower feelings of enrichment where you feel like your spheres aren't helping each other either. So, um, so it's definitely a big, big issue for, for work-life balance. Yes, thank you. And you know, one thing that came to mind for me is just um, thinking of like the engagement that we're talking about and workaholism, those are outcomes. 
right? Yeah, but they're kind of like states. They're like that motivational state is the way to think of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. But that are not, I guess what I'm trying to say, they're not completely dependent on the uh, employee, right? On the person, they're not completely individual. So yes. my work engagement, whether I'm in the state of work engagement or workaholism doesn't depend solely on who I am as a person, right? Yes. It's a lot of interacting things around it. Yes. And it's, to, you know, there, there are some individual, like we do see there's individual differences and with um, telepressure, people who are higher on um, what we call public self-consciousness. So you're worried about how you look to others. So impression management, um, they're more likely to experience telepressure and workaholism, for example. And so, um, yeah, these are all states like in the engagement and workaholism both come from, you know, there are more, there are some personalities at risk for yeah for experiencing those states but it's also the work environment factors that influence those as well sure yeah and you know i think that is very important to discuss right so what is even though you have employees who may have different personalities and some of them are more susceptible susceptible, susceptible. <laughs> to telepressure and workaholism, what can organizations do to um, reduce telepressure and increase sustainable work engagement, particularly now when a lot of us are working remotely? Yeah, well, I'll answer that question by starting with what we can't do, <laughs> like okay. what's not going to work. And what's not going to work is treating this issue as a virtual boundary problem that the employee needs to fix. Like say, hey, why don't you just check emails on your own schedule or establish your own routine? You need to kind of just don't respond to those evening or weekend emails and, um, and even maybe and tell other people like, hey, I'm not going to respond. And um, the problem with that is that work is social. We have a whole team of people to, to consider. And so that's actually going back to like, well, what's the problem? What, um, if we assume that people want to be a good worker, and I think we do, like, I think that that, that is something like assuming the good intentions of the employee. Um, I think it's also understanding that what's happening is right now we have what we call boundaryless work. So there's not really a lot of boundaries on when everyone should be working. And that's great in some regards, because it gives us more flexibility. So if I, you know, have to pick my kids up from school, um, I have the flexibility to duck out early and then catch up on work later that night and kind of make up those hours. But the flexibility also leads to captivity. So if everyone's working on their own schedule, then we're getting communications at all hours. And that's, that's not a bug, that's a feature of flexibility. And so that's going to make us feel like we have to stay online at all times because we get this fear of missing out, right? Like if I don't respond right away, I'm gonna miss out making a contribution to a team. So when I disconnect, I feel left out. I, I feel guilty and I feel like I'm letting other people down. And then what, where, what does guilt and feeling left out lead us to? Workaholism. <laughs> so, the question is, how do you help people feel less guilty? How do you feel like they can take that time and not let people down? And I think that's when organizations have to start thinking about what I like to call strategic disconnection. So this is done as part of a work team um, and ranges from establishing ground rules at the team level, not the individual level, the team level, um, and setting up work processes that help people stick to those rules. So, um, and I know we've kind of talked before, I mentioned the example of this I used in my, my classes, for example, is that like, so people take a lot of online classes these days. Um, I don't, I have a whole thing in my syllabus where I won't respond to evening emails or weekend emails only between business hours, whatever. And that works very well um, until I have midnight deadlines. So if I have a midnight deadline, when are people are gonna need help or have questions or have technical issues? It's gonna be right before midnight when I'm not on. And so if I log in the next day and I see a bunch of panicked emails, what's going on and it's frustrating, 
um, for, and I'm using the students as my team members here, I'm going to feel awful. And what did I learn from that? I can't really take that off. And I'm not going wanting to take that off because I feel like I let them down, that I wasn't there for them when they needed help. And so don't have midnight deadlines, right? I have it during the day and specifically during hours where I know I can get them quick online assistance right when they need it, right before the deadline. Same thing happens in a work team. When do we need help? When do people need assistance? When do they need to have discussions? And when should we give people space for those discussions? So another example of this is you can't just send out something over the weekend and say, hey, let's talk about this issue. What you're doing is rewarding the first people who respond and they get to have input, right? And they get to set the tone of what the ideas are gonna be, what the discussion is. So it's all about a race to who can contribute the fastest. Right. But if I send an email instead that says, hey, let's, um, I have some, I need to talk about this issue. Here's some background. I, you know, we're gonna have, I'm setting a meeting up for this time and we're gonna talk through it there. And I just want you to think about it. And then let's all talk during this meeting. That sets up a very different tone for how that conversation is going to go and expectations for not having a detailed discussion on email. Yeah, it's so interesting, you know, so just this like uh, implicit way of rewarding, right? What are you rewarding in, 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 in the case that you're describing? Are you rewarding a person responding quickly or are you rewarding the actual thinking work that's done? in the uh, background and it sounds like you know with telepressure if you if you keep on rewarding the quick responding you're gonna keep on rewarding this telepressure right correct yeah and it and i think that's what's hard for organizations and leaders to understand that um, cause you'll hear, you're like, oh, well, I didn't mean to do that. Like, no, that's not my intention. Like, or I'll say, I'll send a thing that says, Hey, I don't want you to respond. Um, or don't worry about responding. I'm just going to send this email out tonight and you don't have to respond, but they'll still get response. And they'll be like, why are people still responding? And you're like, that wasn't my intention. And rewards don't have to be intentional. Right. Incentives don't have to be intentional. And so I think people have to really step back and say, what are we rewarding? And be okay with saying, well, I didn't mean to reward that, but how can I set that up where it doesn't get rewarded? And I think um, for an example, another uh, concrete example that I usually try to advocate as much as possible, what's called the scheduled send function in an email. Mm -hmm. So if you're a leader, business leader, trying to give your employees time off or not bugging them on the weekends or evening with an email that's not urgent. Um, they'll say, well, I needed flexibility. I need to respond in the evening. And it's like, you can still respond in the evening, but you can schedule it to not send until eight o'clock the next morning. And so, you know, I learned that myself very early that when I'm working with people that are at a different level of power, so power and impression management come into play here, right? Like no matter how much I tell my students when I email them in the evening, you don't have to respond right back. They wanna be good students. They wanna get back to me. They wanna say, hey, I got it. And so I think about that before sending them something and said, you have scheduled send where it's not gonna bug them till the next day. Mm -hmm. um, and so during work hours. And so that's one of the things that leaders can do too, to use their powers for good in terms of both respecting those boundaries, but also like role modeling that behavior for others. And so again, you can have all these rules and make all these rules, but if the leader is not role modeling, if they're also unintentionally rewarding whoever responds the fastest and they get to dictate what happens next on the project, um, all you're doing is still feeding into that, I feel left out and I feel like a good worker is gonna respond quickly. Yeah, and I love it that you said that rewards don't have to be intentional because I think oftentimes, right, the leaders have good intentions, but there is something else going on over, over there in, in the interactions that leads to negative outcomes. And as you just described, right, you know, it's, if ultimately what we want is sustainable work engagement and not workaholism. So as a leader, what can I do? How can I set up the workflow and how can I role model so that I get the engagement piece? Yeah, yeah, and that, that's really the goal. And that and to me, like, there's not, I want to emphasize, like, there's not a right 
one right way to do it. And that's what makes it difficult that um, these are discussions that you have to have as part of the team and discuss as part of the team on what are the, what's working, what's not working, when do people feel left out, what mediums, and then you set kind of those rules for that, whether it's, um, you know, when you're going to have core group meeting hours and like, we're only gonna make decisions having a, a live discussion after everyone has the information. Um, and then of course you as the leader have to reinforce that and, you know, say things like, it might be like, here's information and then you get that one eager team member who says, oh, yeah, I'm thinking this, this, and this. And you just say, you know, oh, thanks. Just wait until we, we talk about it and we'll get back to that issue, you know, instead of, oh, that's great. And start talking back because I think that's the urge that people have and you want to give them positive feedback. But I think instead the feedback in that situation is like, oh, it's great to hear you're so eager, but please hold on to that. And we'll talk about this as a group. So saying like, this isn't the appropriate medium for us to have that conversation yet. Yeah, and I uh, remember when we talked about this last week, one thing that you mentioned that uh, like really stuck out to me that the other thing that is happening now that we are treating these text messages and emails, all of them as urgent, we can't address the really urgent items when they arise. Yeah, that's when, um, you know, when everything's an emergency, nothing's an emergency. Um, and you can't, we, we are not built to deal with emergencies all the time. I think um, we're, we're, in a, we're in pandemic times right now where I think we've all been at that edge of uncertainty and anxiety and like it has huge health costs and well-being costs. And this is the same thing is that, um, you know, when, when everything's going so quickly, you're like, you're going to make mistakes and you, you lose perspective on what really is urgent and what's important. And that's part of the discussion that needs to happen as the work team, because, you know, you would never make a rule that you absolutely cannot email someone in the evening or weekend. There are times that we need to do that. And you talk about what those are and say like, this is, this is an emergency, like I'll, I'll have to do that. But then what you also do is when you send that urgent message, you acknowledge the, the, the violation of the rule in terms of like, hey, I know I'm sorry to bug you. I, sh you know, I know this is outside of it, but I really and justify, I really do think this is emergency and here's why. Um, instead of, you know, just sending, sending things, you know, and I think, again, it's part of a feedback loop where, um, you know, sometimes if in, as a leader, if you have people doing that, like I just have an emergency, if it really was an emergency, then you have that feedback loop of saying, hey, this, this really wasn't like this could have waited till the next day. So that would be an example of something we want to wait on versus, you know, and so give, giving those little nudges each way to, because it's not just about establishing the rules, it's about reinforcing them and making sure, again, that you're not incentivizing the wrong behavior. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm just reflecting on like my own feelings and experience, and I can totally see if, if I know that like my rest and recovery space is honored and respected, and when I get that urgent emergency email, like I won't have a problem addressing it. It will, it will make me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't, I can't be sustaining it over a prolonged period of time. I can't be, I can't addressing every email as an emergency and still maintain my sanity. Yeah. And that, that hits the other piece on like, why is it worth it for organizations? Because again, you, not only are you responding to that, you're also at your best responding to that and motivated. And you're like, yes, I, I do see this as an emergency. And I felt that you usually respect my boundaries. So this, this is an appropriate reason for that. And I think it does, it just changes the motivational framework in that way that, that is helpful and also still reestablishes the whole purpose, like, you know, of, of organizational support. So this idea that like, what can organizations do to actually signal that they care about workers, that they you know care about your well-being? And I think not sending emails or only doing emergencies, um, setting up these work teams, even just having that discussion on, we all feel really extended right now and we need to make a change. And how can we make a change that will make us all feel at our best 
and feel like we're still not letting others down. Even having that conversation is so powerful and it's a first step, right? And the first step of an ongoing commitment and vigilance to strategic disconnection. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. That makes so much sense, <laughs> really. <laughs> yes, and you know, the other thing that comes to mind is that knowing how, um, it's probably a continuous conversation, right? It's not like we're establishing our um, boundaries right now and that's how they're going to be this year and next year and forever but it's continuously reassessing it how is it working is it working if something's not yeah. working what's not working what can we change and the one thing that i loved that you mentioned like the word workflow mm -hmm. right? so how how as a team do we design our work and the flow of it so we all get the time to disconnect yes um, and the pattern in, in word workflow too, like we think about that as organizational psychology is this is a pattern of activity. So part of it is stepping back and saying, what are our usual pattern of activities? What's functional? What's dysfunctional? How can we adjust it? And, um, and like you said, it's, it's continuous reevaluation. You know, the best thing is to be a team of scientists yourself running little mini experiments. Is it working? Is this not working? And also just some things that work really well don't work under certain conditions for a set amount of time or in certain situations. And I think acknowledging that discussion, but I think it always reminds me of my general research when I talk about work-life balance. It's a similar thing with boundaries because work-life balance is also about boundaries. How do we set boundaries around these expectations and what we're giving and what we're getting from different domains of our life? And um, work-life balance is not a verb. It's not an accomplishment. It's not an end state. It's not a trophy you put up and say, I've got it now and I'm good. Um, work-life balancing is an activity. Um, it is a, well, I like to even think of it as work-life management. It's a way, um, just like you'd have like budget management, relationship management. This is an ongoing process that we have. And, you know, we know that when we're in a relationship with someone, we have to continue having those discussions and good communication for that to be a good relationship. These are work relationships. We have a relationship with our boss, with our colleagues, with our clients. And part of that is having those discussions. And the key again is to communication. What are our boundaries? What is an appropriate, respectful way to think about someone's cycle of um, work and recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Because it's also, you know, what, what it brings for, for me to mind is that sometimes I think we get this like view of there's like a, a, a worker, there's like work. <laughs> And then life is like, it's completely separate. Like you come to work, you, you need to work and you need to be engaged and you need to do your best, but they're not really separate. Your life does affect your work and your work does affect your life. So it's really looking at the person as a human being with a life and yeah. being a part of that life. And so how can I, again, as a leader, help this person integrate the work as a part of their life successfully. So we can all benefit from that. Yeah, exactly. And that that's that's part of like understanding. And I think that's what we try to work on as psychologists, because we know this intuitively. Like you said, I get up, I'm at home, I go to work now, now even virtually work at home is the same place half the time. But so I think it's more obvious now. I think people are thinking about that more because the virtual boundaries, you don't even have that transition time. But even that transition time, like I don't stop being me. Like if you if you had a tough morning, if you didn't have sleep. You didn't have, if you had a fight in the morning with a family member or something like that, you don't just flip off a switch and say, whoop, now I'm a happy worker, you know? And so, um, and I think that's where organizations have to understand that sustainable engagement is that workaholics will sacrifice their own health, well being, family, social relationships, you know, for work. And that makes them less a less happy person, a less productive person over time. It burns them out. And they can't get that spark back. They can't get that work engagement spark back. And it's why organizations should really care about it is that once you lose that spark, it's 
harder to get it back than when you just see early warning signs, right? And have those discussions, mm -hmm. hey, something's happening. It's just like if you have a bad relationship, right? Something goes wrong, it's harder to fix something that's at such a severe level and to get back somewhere when you see early warning signs and say, hey, let's talk. It's the same type of process. And so, yeah, really it's kind of respecting the whole employee and understanding like this is a part of their life and how can you help make work fit in with their life. And I mentioned that word, like we talked about work-life enrichment. That happens a lot too, that like, you know, being happy at home, you get to bring that into the workplace or skills like my, you know, my skills on if I have five kids and I'm managing all their schedules and time management, I get to bring those time management coordination scheduling skills into the workplace. Like yes. they're the same skills, right? <laughs> You know what I love the most that what I'm hearing you say is that ultimately even the like negative effects they all stem from good intentions whether I'm uh, I'm in a state of work engagement or in workaholics my intentions were initially good you know you mentioned that workaholic will just sacrifice everything for work but it doesn't lead to any good outcomes for the worker or for the organization long term. Yeah, and I think it's like sitting down and having that conversation with like, we know you want to do well, we know you want to put the best in, but how can we help you manage that time? And I think this is where the conversation of the language is. And we, we have a trouble with these ideas of looking the busyness, busiest, like being so busy or this badge of honor. I didn't get good sleep. You know, I sacrificed my sleep last night and you come in and people talk about that. Um, as look how committed I am because that's the message and then people reinforce that yes and instead you know what I'm asking leaders to do is when you're like wow or I'm working all these hours and you and how different of a reaction it is when you say oh I'm worried about your well-being or do you want help with time management because if it's taking you that long or, or is there training I need to provide what kind of support can I give you to get you down to reasonable hours, right? And then so that you're refreshed or my biggest one, since I study sleep too, is just calling out like, someone's like, yeah, I only got three hours of sleep last night and saying, oh, well, did you know, according to research, if you didn't get enough sleep, you're that's like coming to work with a blood alcohol level over the legal limit. So you're basically working drunk right now. <laughs> I don't want that person on my team. They're not making good decisions. I want you to go home and take a nap is what I want you to do before you come in and do work. Cause I don't think you're at your best and I don't think we can depend on you right now. And that's not where the conversation is, especially in American culture right now. And we have to, to change that uh, discussion for sure. I love that you mentioned that because it, it has been on the forefront of my mind. It's like, okay, I do see this um culture of wearing exhaustion as a badge of honor i'm exhausted means i work well i'm a good employee so thank you for giving some specific examples on how that mindset can be changed from the leadership uh perspective yeah and the other one i will also say is i a conversation i have with my with my own colleagues are are you busy or are you productive and you know, productivity is about input to output ratios, how much effort you're putting in versus the outcomes. And busyness is just doing a lot of stuff. And I think that's where the conversation needs to come in with really looking at the outcomes, like what, what outcomes are you producing and why is it taking you all that time to produce these outcomes? And, um, and, and to be fair, that's where, to me, I see that's where telepressure comes from, these, these issues too, because again, good intentions, if I feel less productive, like I feel like I'm not at my best or doing good work, how I might try to compensate for that is responding very quickly to emails and being online all the time. Yes. To yes. Yeah, just say, look, I'm a good worker, I'm a good worker, because you're actually kind of nervous about the actual product produced, but um, if you're producing good work, you're producing good work. And I think going into that, what is the actual outcome and expectations on what we want about outcomes? Don't worry about all this impression management mm -hmm. side of it. Yes, thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Lacey. Well, I love this. I'm so glad we got to talk about this. I think such an important topic in general, you know, workplace boundaries, but particularly now. Okay, so before we complete, I wanted to ask you, uh, so what, what are you doing right now? What type of research? What kind of projects? Yeah, so still doing um, telepressure research, I think, um, you know, I started out with, you know, creating the measure and looking at kind of the outcomes. And so now, you know, a lot of my research, I'm starting trying to build more into um, intervention uh, work. So what can we actually do about this? And not just at the individual level, because I think people hear telepressure and they're like, oh, give me some email management tips, you know, and I think as I mentioned before, it's not an individual problem. The problem isn't you managing you managing your emails, the problem is you want to be a good worker and stay online all the time. So it's about managing the work environment. So it's a group and team level. And like I said, these, these have to be conversations at that level. So um, right now I'm trying, I'm working more on creating webinars and building a toolkit to help organizations tackle this from a group level issue too. What are the ways teams can walk through some of these questions they can ask themselves or exercises, um, even examples of virtual boundaries and things. Because again, it's not, when we talk about virtual boundaries, it's not a menu. It's not, you have to do all these things. You know, it's a, um, you know, it, uh, or I should say it's more like that menu. You can pick and choose what it is. It's not like a sequence of like, you have to do all these things, like pick and choose what works for you, you know, cafeteria style and things might not work for your team, might work for others. So yeah, I was thinking on the menu thing, it was more like a seven course meal. It's not being at a restaurant with a seven course meal and you have to have that seven course meal, right? It's it's the buffet cafeteria, there's a bunch of things in front of you, you know, if, if you want the, the certain, like if you want the, the chicken wings, go for the chicken wings. But if you don't want the fries, don't take the fries, do the fruit cup instead, it's fine. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I was trying to figure out like ways that through a lot of the discussions I've had on how we can help people go through that and um, you know working on trying to get um, grant funding and trying to find organizational partners to help test out these interventions. So, you know, we're still working on kind of developing the materials and things, but we would definitely love to have organizations, um, you know, to, to help us test out these interventions and help us collect data on their effectiveness because we want to see what works for them, uh, what doesn't. So there, um, anyone who's listening is feel free to reach out to me at my SDSU contact information. So lbarber at sdsu.edu if you're interested and uh, we'd love to talk more. Amazing, yes, thank you for offering that. And I highly encourage everyone who has interest in uh, creating some uh, virtual uh, workplace boundaries to reach out because you get a top tier researcher <laughs> who uh, has coined the term telepressure and done a lot of research on that to help you uh, yeah. implement some interventions in your organizations to create some good workplace boundaries. So yeah, thanks. I yeah, one of them, I feel already reaching out to you for sure. <laughs> yeah, and that's why for, for me, you know, uh, for, con you know, cause I'll do consulting with that, but one way to reduce consulting fees or get rid of them is to participate in data collection. So uh, happy to, to negotiate that for sure. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Lacey. This has been so uh, juicy and exciting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, Lacey. I was so happy to have you here. Oh, I'm so glad you invited me because, um, like I said, these are all my favorite things to talk about. And I love what you're doing here and with the summit and spreading the good word. So I'm hoping we can actually make a big difference for encouraging sustainable engagement organizations. So thank you for setting this up and inviting me to help um, help with your mission. Thank you. That is my intention as well. Uh, so thank you, friends. I hope you all enjoyed this just as much as I did. And I will see you tomorrow at Sustainable Work.